this has been a, quite quite the turn of events. Uh, it's it's just been crazy, sir. So it's awesome to be able to see you. It's great to see you again, Mike. It's been a few years. Yes, it has. So as we get going, before uh, jumping into you know some of the conversation questions that I've you know ha had in my mind, yeah, you know, I want to tell like all of the members from Team Red, White, and Blue a couple of quick stories uh, about you, sir. The first one is uh, that, of course, I knew about you as the general um, in my time as a lieutenant and a captain in the, in the military, but. On July 1st, 2009, I showed up on my Cipernet and I had an email from General David Petraeus, CENTCOM commander. And immediately, like, my heart, like, skipped a few beats because I wasn't sure if it was, like, really good or really bad. Uh, and it turned out to be a really good note. Um, you had basically said, hey, I spoke to another general who listened to you give a presentation about Afghanistan. He also said that you were going back to graduate school and then going back to teach at West Point. And I'd like to find a way to keep you engaged in whatever way that you see fit, because he said that your knowledge of Southern Afghanistan was uh, was really good. So uh, that then ex you know, a couple, we exchanged a couple of emails and came up with a plan of, hey, I'm going to do whatever I can while I transition to graduate school to uh, to continue trying to add value wherever I could. Uh, and so that's just one quick story. And, and then the other one, you know, really centers around. Um, your role, the role that you played as an inspiration for why Team Red, White, and Blue even exists. Uh, in those subsequent months after uh, we had first connected in July of 2009 and I started graduate school at the University of Michigan, um, you know, I observed your work ethic and how much you care and how hard you worked. Uh, and it really pushed me as I was in grad school to think about, like, what am I going to do? You know, how can I continue to serve and how can I push you know, to give more? Um, and you were always in the back of my mind as that source of inspiration um, you know, for somebody who you know, gave so much to the country. So uh, again, two quick uh, stories on the background oh, of how I, I came to know you first. So, Thanks. Um, I remember those I mean, episodes well. And I remember sorry. you getting the idea of Team Red, White, and Blue and then starting it out from scratch and building it around the whole idea that, you know, it's okay to get together to have a beer or whatever, but you got to run first or do something else first. <laughs> That's uh, it. It really has blossomed into an extraordinary organization. As you mentioned, over 200,000 strong. Yeah. Yes, sir. Absolutely. It's really uh, pretty, pretty cool. And I hope you don't mind it. Obviously, you know, I'm going to continue to call you, sir. Uh, I, I even shaved today before our conversation. I was like, you know, I got to make sure that I'm, I'm, I'm looking good here. So, um, <laughs> So the first thing, just it really just, again, really, this is just a conversation and a dialogue, but yeah, I think that our members, you know, so many of them, as you know, 70% are veterans or, or guard or reservists or active duty, and then 30% are military family members and support. Um, and I think a lot of us are really just wondering a lot of the same questions right now. And really that is like, like, what are your thoughts about like the overall state of the nation and, you know, this crisis that you know, we're about, I guess, a week and a half now into like just a sort of uh, open mic night. Like, what are your thoughts right now ab about where things are at? Well, I don't think we've ever faced anything like this in our lifetimes. Uh, this is not just an extraordinary global health crisis, a, a pandemic, uh, a novel virus, a coronavirus that is spreading throughout the world at a very, very rapid rate, uh, different stages in different countries. But the response to that virus uh, has cratered the economy and various of our industries are literally on life support. Thankfully, Congress is addressing this right now together with the Secretary of Treasury and the White House and they appear to have an agreement on a massive bill. This will be the third of the economic support bills, but this is so large, it's, it's, I think it's literally twice the size of our entire discretionary budget uh, wow. for each fiscal year, noting that the non-discretionary, the uh, other elements are actually larger. But it's an extraordinary commitment uh, by those in Washington to take care of those who have been hurt uh, so substantially by this. And of course, the knowledge of this, I think, has the country, the state of the union, if you will, is somewhat mixed. Uh, it's mm -hmm equal parts worried, uh, determined, um, it's apprehensive, uh, it's unemployed, um, it is uh, resolute, um, it's all of that. And people trying to figure out how they can get on with their lives while still adhering to the social distancing and indeed the lockdown in some parts of our country uh, that has nothing 
ongoing except for the absolute essential uh, services that are provided. Uh, and while still, again, interacting with people, uh, still in many cases performing their, their jobs, I mean, I'm one of the lucky ones, if you will, who operates remotely so much of the time because of my crazy travel schedule that uh, this is not that different. Um, in fact, I'm not yet missing the elements of the crazy travel schedule, and I've had more walks with the family dog, uh, Freya the Wonder Dog Corgi Lab Mix, uh, in the past two weeks, I think, than I've had in the past two years. Um, but, but of course, a lot of people can't carry out their, mm -hmm. their normal jobs. A lot of people are wondering, or were wondering, at least until Congress took this really quite decisive action. When you think that this is all passed in less than a week and presumably will be signed into law by the president uh, tomorrow or the next day, uh, that's an extraordinary response. Uh, and again, a level that is, is multiples of what was done back in 2008 in the wake of the financial crisis. So it's, a, it's an uncertain time. It's an unsettling time. It's a time, again, of um, where different people are able to react in different ways. And it's one of those times where organizations like Team Red, White, and Blue, I think, can come to the fore, uh, can connect uh, virtually now, of course, uh, with the membership, uh, and try to pass on tips, uh, ideas, energy, uh, example, perhaps, um, fortitude. Uh, and in some cases, it's going to have to be sympathy because this virus will obviously strike down members of Team Red, White, and Blue if it hasn't already. Uh, and we're already seeing that there, this virus doesn't differentiate between classes of people. The heir to the crown in the UK has been diagnosed positive. Uh, many other prominent individuals uh, have also been diagnosed positive. Some have, have died already. Um, and then it's just spreading throughout the general population in certain areas uh, like New York City and the immediate surroundings uh, at a very, very rapid rate as the authorities indeed implement measures to try to flatten the curve, as they say, to flatten how high the transmission will go so that it doesn't overwhelm the medical capabilities while also working very, very hard, employing active guard and reserve components as well to expand the capabilities of our health system, uh, all in coordination uh, under the oversight of FEMA uh, and working obviously very closely with uh, federal, state, local authorities and with the Department of Health and Human Services. Yeah, I mean, and, and that's one of the things, and we'll provide some detail on the front end of this as well about your current role at KKR and the role that you play you know, with international travel and, and meeting so many people from all over the world. And as you said, that's one of the things that's so unique about this, it seems, is that really, you know, it's affecting people, not just all over the United States, but in many parts of the world, right? Uh, yeah, and, the, and look, this is a virus. This does not observe boundaries. Uh, it's right. not intimidated by customs and, and borders. Um, it spreads, uh, and it is spreading at a very, very high rate. Uh, as we have seen, and that requires very, very aggressive measures to counter its transition, to try to reduce it, uh, and to try to keep it as manageable as absolutely possible, while the various authorities are ramping rapidly to increase testing, to increase the capabilities to deal with this with, with medical items like ventilators and, and all the rest. Uh, and it really is a race against that crest right now in places like New York City and some of the other most affected locations in the United States, having already seen that transpire uh, in China, which was the epicenter, of course, at the outset in Wuhan, uh, and having watched it in a number of other countries, uh, the, the other most worrisome, of course, being Italy, uh, which has seen this progress very, very rapidly and in an area that had quite advanced uh, medical capabilities. Yeah, and speaking of that, I've got some friends that are stationed over at the 173rd, you know, in Vicenza, and I've seen some of their posts on social media talking about, as you just said, about how, how dire the situation is and how aggressive the posture now is. 
Um, you know, it's at times like these that, you know, we often will see Americans, and you alluded to this a little bit just a second ago, you know, coming together in unique ways to support one each other. Um, like what's so far, even though we're not able to come together physically, like, like we were just a week ago, like, uh, have you seen other ways that people are coming together to support each other right, uh, in this time of crisis? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And in fact, I'm almost overwhelmed now by all of the Zoom sessions and Skype and FaceTime that uh, people are requesting. And yeah, I mean, we always had lots and lots of phone conferences and a variety of other uh, in-person meetings. And now what we've done is just transition those to, again, to virtual means of connecting. And that, I think, has been quite effective. Uh, I also think that it's actually very important to do this in, in our personal lives. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we're very disappointed we can't see our granddaughter or shouldn't see our granddaughter right now, who's just a, you know, a few miles away. Well, so we're doing FaceTime or Zoom meetings with, with her and with uh, our daughter and son-in-law. Um, our, our son and, and, and daughter, both veterans, by the way, they both served in in uh, Afghanistan and our son, in fact, with the 173rd and then the Rangers uh, together in Brooklyn right now. Uh, his school said, go away. He's doing Harvard Business School and Law School. And they said, don't come back after spring break. And so they're doing virtual academics. Um, and again, we did virtual drinks with them the other night. Um, we, You know, you can do virtual coffee in, instead of the actual. So all of this, I think, is very, very important. And even doing it actually in your own neighborhoods. Um, all of this to try to keep in touch with those, uh, particularly those I think who are uh, in the more vulnerable uh, ages, uh, those who are less fortunate than we are. I mean, we've been very concerned about a variety of small businesses that, you know, all of us have these in our lives, the favorite coffee shop, the barber mm -hmm. shop, the dry cleaners, um, you know, the list goes on. And they are very, very hard hit uh, by what is going on. Um, I talked to somebody who drives me some of the times for business stuff and asked him how he's doing. He said, it's dead. I mean, this is a cell phone business. So again, this will be helped considerably by what Congress uh, and the executive branch have come together uh, to agree on very, very considerably. Uh, but still this has, brought real worry and, and, and I'm sure sleepless nights to those who did what really is the driver of our economy, which is, mm -hmm. again, sort of mom and pop, small and medium yeah. enterprises um, that have then built into something bigger than that uh, and are the ones that are most vulnerable when all of travel, tourism, hospitality and leisure just gets taken down at the knees. Yeah, and I've seen that firsthand. You know, I live right outside Fort Bragg, um, you know, in a town that's got a lot of tourism and everything has come to a screeching halt. Um, and got a lot like of said, barber shops too. Effect. And, mm -hmm. uh, and they are obviously going to be devastated by this uh, to some degree. Uh, and, yeah. and again, how are we gonna help them get through that? Again, what Congress has done, I think is very, very important. But, you know, for those who has, of us who have been fortunate, I think it's, it's time to, again, look out for those who, who haven't been quite so fortunate or yeah, are still, I, I, still getting to that point in their lives. Could, couldn't agree more. And I think you know, one of the ideas I've heard, sir, has been pretty good, which is you know, this idea of like buying gift cards right now, right? If yep. you can, if we've, you can afford to. And then, exactly right. Yeah. You know, and then let them, you know, sometime down the road, we can cash that exactly. in or whatever, That's right. uh, if, if ever. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Um, so I'd be interested in your take on this as well, you know, uh, at Team Red, White, and Blue, we've got this phrase called born for the storm. Um, and, and by that, really, we mean that, um, you know, that veterans, especially what they've gone through in their military service, uh, the amount of resilience, the amount of adversity that they've overcome, if you've made it through boot camp and AIT, let alone, you know, a combat rotation or, or two. Um, so just thoughts on, in general, the, the readiness or veterans, their ability to be able to, to lead and to step up in their communities in times of adversity like we're seeing right now. Yeah, no, I think this is quite important, actually. And, you know, you and I have discussed before how I believe this particular generation, the post 9-11 generation, which you're really a part of, which I was privileged to lead in Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, that, that this is rightly described as America's new greatest generation. And of course, 
what made the World War II generation the greatest generation wasn't actually just what they did on the battlefield, however extraordinary that was and consequential it was for the world in, in fighting fascism and so forth. Um, so it's not just what transpired on the battlefield, it's what they did when they came home. Um, and you do see that with the post 9-11 generation, keeping in mind that, that every single person that wore the uniform uh, in the wake of post 9-11 was a volunteer, uh, mm -hmm. raised his or her right hand, took an oath of, of, of enlistment service, uh, and, and then did that knowing that it could mean deployment to a combat zone, in many cases, re-enlisting. Uh, you'll recall that the largest re-enlistment ceremony we believe in history was on July 4th, 2008 in Baghdad, of all places. I was privileged to be the, uh, the re-enlistment officer. And as I looked at this huge group of 1,215 soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines, uh, surrounded by all the re-enlistment counselors and a lot of commanders and others, uh, it was a sea of uniforms. And you know, you're wondering what in the world is going on here. Uh, you know, this isn't for the the, the stock bonus or something right. like that. <laughs> uh, the stock options. This is because they believe in the the privilege, really, of performing a mission that's larger than self, of doing that with others who feel the same way. And of doing it at a time when the country, whether the individuals believe in the missions we're performing or not, or agree with them or not, uh, certainly agree that our men and women in uniform deserve their support, their thanks, and their respect. And, you know, that's what has motivated this generation. Now millions have returned to uh, the private sector. Uh, and in doing that, bring, of course, these experiences that, that you just highlighted, the you know, being in tough places, in some cases taking tough casualties, in many cases truly life and life or death uh, situations, um, difficult terrain, horrific weather conditions, uh, and just plain hard missions. And again, that experience does give you resilience. Uh, it does give you a sense of what inner determination we all possess. And I do think it's time that, that you can share that sense uh, with others, while certainly not making light at all of what it is that people are experiencing. Because in some cases, uh, this is an, a financial and economic existential threat uh, to small and medium enterprises in particular. But again, a time when we can come together and when those who have done that on battlefields uh, can also do that in their own communities. Yeah, that, that's awesome. Yeah, I, uh, yeah, obviously I agree with, you know, what your description of, you know, what servicemen and women have been through and how that positions them, you know, uh, ideally for the rest of their lives to be able to, to lead into love with resilience. Um, you know, uh, one of the ways that we're challenging our members in Team Red, White, and Blue, you might have heard about this, the campaign is to wear red to give red. Uh, you know, we yeah. spent communications back and forth actually with a veteran at the Red Cross uh, who highlighted to us, look, there's a big shortage. Number one, uh, a lot of the clinics that are run, right, are, are staffed by people who are, who are older or, or who might not be able to uh, you know, to come out, right, because of the virus. Um, and then a lot of the people that give blood are in, in, you know, in their 60s and 70s. And so there's this shortage on, like, the, the amount of clinics, and there's also a shortage of people to staff them, and then a shortage of people stepping forward to give blood. And so what we've done really is we've issued a challenge to, to all of our members uh, to step forward and to, you know, to give blood. And, and you know, I just would be curious, because um, I go back to my time when I was at Camp Taji in 2004 and five, and there was a a massive, you know, vehicle borne IED explosion that took place. And I remember like there being an all call and seeing like a bunch of soldiers just like running to tents, um, basically like, cause their, their blood was needed like immediately. Um, and that's still, that memory still feels, you know, while it was 15 years ago, it feels like in some ways it was just yesterday. Like, do you have any memories when you think about blood drives or a situation like that where people kind of, you know, soldiers or servicemen and women put like sure. the needs of other people, you know, before their own? Yeah. No, I remember numerous of those occasions. In fact, I remember the case at, at Camp Taji. I was the commander of Minstiki, uh, the Multinational Security Transition Command, Iraq. And Taji was one of the biggest bases at which we had the train and equip mission going on and had a couple of different 
uh, division headquarters and logistics uh, facilities located there. Very, very considerable uh, commitment, and that was a huge blow that day. And now I remember those over the years that at various times there were calls for that, and, and you know, you'd turn out for it. And I actually remember that we made it competitive in some respects. That, you know, not only are you going to give blood, but let's see who's resting heart rate can be the lowest in this particular yeah. <laughs> occasion. Um, so, you know, you always uh, can find a way to make something competitive, which, which always adds to the, to the enjoyment. Especially for you, sir. You love competition. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. I, uh, I actually, when I made my post about it, I, I kind of, uh, I, paid, I pulled a play out of that playbook. Uh, I, 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 I donated one pint, right? So 16 ounces in three minutes and 45 seconds. Uh, the record, I, cause I asked them when I got tapped my van, I said, what's the record for here today? And they said 347. So, uh, so you know, like I said, got to find ways to make, make it make a little competitive and, and a little bit fun. <laughs> One more than you, big guy. That's it. I know that. <laughs> Speaking of that, you know, I, I've seen this actually play out for Team Red, White, and Blue. Um, right now we have this thing going on called, you know, the virtual version of March Madness. And we're, and we're essentially having veterans in each state compete against each other. So right now I'm in North Carolina. And so it's North Carolina versus Ohio. And it's basically, you know, today's workout, um, you're probably aware today is, um, you know, National Medal of Honor Day. Um, and so, we, you know, there's been 3,508 uh, men who have been uh, presented the Medal of Honor over the years. And like, so we did a symbolic workout of essentially a combination of push-ups and air squats, um, you know, uh, sit-ups, and it was having to do with those numbers. Um, but to your point about competition, veterans, they thrive on competition. And we've seen like our organization come to life in a way that, uh, that we've really not seen in quite some time because we're having veterans from states compete against one another. I mean, any thoughts on that? Like, so I know you're like off the charts, like on, on, on the love and the passion for competition, but we know it in the military, there's such a, a path, like any thoughts on that? Like, like where does that come from oh, or, sure. or what, you know, powerful? Oh, look, I, look, I, I mean, we used to often say that, you know, life is a competitive endeavor, embrace it, yeah. uh, get over it, realize that you yeah. don't get a t-shirt just for showing up in real life, that you actually yeah. do have to compete and that we should all try to compete to be the very best that we can be, to try to help our unit be the best that it can be. And by the way, sometimes you have to compete to be the best team player that you can be. Uh, I remember on the fight to Baghdad when I was privileged to command the 101st Airborne Division. Um, and at a certain point in time, I realized that, you know, the 101st Airborne Division's next rendezvous with destiny, this great phrase that comes from General Order Number 1 when the founding division commander said the 101st Airborne Division has no history, but it has a, a rendezvous with destiny. And so ever after that, we've always got that into our mission. Uh, you know, the next rendezvous with destiny is north to Baghdad, uh, that kind of stuff. And I realized, you know what, uh, the best contribution the 101st Airborne Division can make to the overall fight right now is actually to support the 3rd Infantry Division mechanized. And oh, by the way, the 82nd Airborne Division ought to do the same thing, which is further to the south. They ought to give up their hope of jumping on Baghdad Airport. We should give up our hope of their assaulting on the Baghdad Airport. We should all support, follow and support uh, the 3rd Infantry Division, the Marne Division, because it was best configured, best trained, best equipped for the fight that we were now in. And we realized that, and we pushed our 72 Apaches out in front of the 3ID, uh, when I was asked by the, my Martin 6, he called me up and asked if we had any 155 millimeter howitzer ammunition to share because it did, they were going black, I think, on that and mm -hmm. a bunch of other munitions. And I said, yeah, not only do we have it to share, I'll give you the entire unit because that will get it to you faster uh, than if we had to download it, put it on trucks and drive it to you and so forth. And, and then he asked for an infantry battalion. In fact, I gave him the battalion that I had been privileged to command when I was a battalion commander, third of the 187. So again, you've got to keep that in, in check to a degree that it can't mm -hmm. become so, you know, you can't be so fiercely ambitious with your competition uh, that you're just sort of running over others mm -hmm. or disregarding them. You, and at the end of the day, you do have to be, be the best team player as well as the best individual and the best unit that you can be. Um, and if you can keep that in mind, then I think, you've got the right approach, but competition does spur everything. It's one of the great productivity enhancers of the world. And 
you, you know well that in, you know, in, as a battalion, a brigade commander, all these different, we always had physical fitness competitions. I used to grade all of them uh, as far as when I was a brigade commander in the 82nd Airborne. And then when I became a division commander, I just couldn't, I couldn't be the grader for every one of them. So we, we actually certified a bunch of air assault, airborne ranger uh, sergeants who would do that. Um, but we had it even at the staff college. It was called the Iron Major Competition. And I always did compete um, and tried to be, obviously, <laughs> you know, the best I could be, although it got a little bit more challenging uh, as the years went by. But it was always enormous fun. And frankly, I think, you know, those who were competing and really had a shot at being the top uh, enjoyed seeing these old guys out there trying Absolutely. to keep up with it. Yeah, there's two uh, two general officers over all the years I've had the privilege of working with and uh, who who consistently, every time I ever worked out with them, smoked me. And it was you and then uh, General Clark, who's now commander of SOCOM. <laughs> oh, uh, yeah. He, he put me in a hurt box uh, one time when I was, I was a major at West Point and I was in pretty good shape, but I was I was in really good running shape. And we did this this uh, this series of like push-ups and pull-ups and dips and we went up to 10 and then down to one and I, I could not put a shirt on for like two days there it was it was bad he's um, an animal yeah but both both it was always fascinating to see like you know the pride and you know in the physical activity and, and that actually kind of transitions into my next question and I just got a few more and we're just really grateful for your time today um you know really kind of uh dovetailing off this idea of physical activity and competition um we know from the research uh you, you know you've lived it I've lived it in, in our lives we've seen it but we also know it objectively from the data that Consistent physical activity, um, you know, it, it pushes cortisol and stress hormones out. It helps you feel better, right? Physically, it's good for you. Um, mentally, psychologically, it helps. It puts you in a better mood, right? There, there's like all these benefiting factors of physical activity, right? With, with the emphasis, I think, on consistent, right? Like you can't do it once a week and then draw all those benefits. It's this idea of can you consistently weave it into your life? Um, I'd just love to just hear your thoughts. And, and I already know personally, because you and I have talked about this a lot, but like as you think back and you look back at your career and like all the stressful places you find yourself leading, right? Like, like what kind of role has that played? And what can we as members of Team Red, White, and Blue as we really turn into our left and to our right, talking to fellow veterans, like, hey, get moving. It's not, you know, not just for you, but it's for the whole good of the people to your left and to your right. Um, thoughts on just the role that physical activity plays in terms of, you know, um, mental acuity and mental well-being. I think it's enormous. It's huge. It's important. It's vital. It's critical. It's all of that. Um, don't forget the endorphins, by the way, um, and the fact that you sleep better. And, you know, look, even when we were in combat, uh, we tried. Um, and of course, you didn't have any apparatus out there for a long period of time. And, you know, certainly when you were doing the offensive operations early on, once we got settled, obviously, that, that started to be established. But, but the truth is, you don't need much uh, to run around the perimeter of a, of a base. And you don't need much to do push-ups and sit-ups and a variety of other exercises just using your own body weight, uh, flexibility, mobility, all, all of that. Um, and it, I think it plays an enormous role. Look, even during the surge in Iraq, um, I would still work out religiously every morning. I mean, we had a routine that we really tried to stick to, get up about 5.15, get a cup of coffee, quick look through the classified uh, mm -hmm. email and all that stuff, get an Intel book, hop on a stationary bike, and you can actually pedal a stationary bike and, and read stuff uh, at the same time. Uh, do a variety of other exercises. We had a little small, tiny gym in this uh, building in which uh, my team and I were located. Um, and, and then, you know, get breakfast and you're already have done something useful uh, by the time of the 7.30 a.m. battlefield update and analysis. That was the official start to, to every day that we spent there. And we actually fenced time uh, two or three days a week, we would try to fence time um, in the afternoon to run. And we were fortunate to be on a huge compound that actually had mm -hmm. about a six, uh, almost a 10 kilometer uh, perimeter. And we'd actually bring in um, majors from units that were on the, the larger base uh, just to run with me so I could pick their brain and find out how things were going. They were all in battalions that were located in different 
uh, areas of Baghdad. And on a couple of occasions, these were significant exchanges. I mean, the most significant was when a battalion XO, uh, whom, whom I aided and recruited to run with us, said, you know, we got this guy. He once he was a bad guy. Now he wants to be a good guy. He's fed up with Al-Qaeda. Uh, mm -hmm. They've blown up his house, his front yard, uh, injured his family members. And he wants to turn against them if we'll support him. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I know that's really sensitive, especially in Baghdad, because it's mixed Sunni Shia. Uh, the agency was a little bit in the periphery of this thing. All the rest of it, I said, forget all that. You go back immediately. Don't finish the run even, which is a big deal for me. Uh, you go back, get hold of your battalion commander. You tell him, support that guy, and I'll deal with the, the palace, if you will. I'll square it away with the prime minister. I'll square it away with... General Odierno and the chain of command between you and me, because um, this is too important an opportunity. This is a really pivotal, potentially fleeting opportunity, mm -hmm. and we need to exploit it, capitalize on it right now. And that turned out to be the catalyst for what then took place in inside Baghdad, having already taken place out in Anbar province and begun up, so without the Euphrates River Valley and now up the Tigris River Valley, the so-called awakening, uh, which did not occur, by the way, by us just paying people or buying them off because we couldn't initially in the early months. Right. This was capitalizing on their desire uh, and their frustration with Al-Qaeda in Iraq and the major Sunni insurgent groups that made life difficult for them and made them realize that they could have a better life if they supported the new Iraq, if we secure them, uh, than if they continue to oppose either actively or tacitly uh, supporting the insurgents. So... Again, running was always part of, of my life and cycling and other endurance sports, as well as certainly strength with, uh, with body weight in particular, but, you know, with iron occasionally as well. We had competitions, yeah, and, and again, even in these areas, um, these runs always began, it was supposed to be at talking pace. And, you know, that would go on for two or maybe three miles. And then all of a sudden you'd notice it was just being <laughs> increased. And, you know, in the end, uh, and, you know, ultimately I had to reconcile myself to the fact that uh, the great Everett Spain, now yeah. head of the behavioral science and leadership yeah. department at West Point was, was going to leave me in the dust, which is pretty humiliating. Yeah. <laughs> um, he'd be in a major at the time. Um, and then that one of my great security detachment guys would actually leave all of us uh, in yeah. his dust. So, but, but I think it's hugely important to do that. Uh, and occasionally you can do it in a way where you're actually working out while still working, multitasking. Uh, mm -hmm. I do that a lot still. And we've got a great little gym downstairs here with a life cycle and a treadmill and some weights and benches and dip and pull up bars and all the rest of that and mats and so forth. Uh, and a flat screen TV and a yeah. fan to blow on you while you're on the bike because otherwise uh, oh, yeah. it's... the perspiration is going to be horrendous because <laughs> uh, yeah. there's no air moving. But but again, this is it, it should be a way of life. Um, and mm -hmm. that's what we tried to convey. We tried to create a culture, again, that embraced the idea that life is a competitive endeavor, uh, that, that a soldier's most important weapon system is his own body, uh, yeah. And that we have a responsibility, not just to ourselves, but to those that are right and left, uh, to ensure that that body is as capable as it possibly can be. Yeah, absolutely. And of course, in the, that description, of course, is your, your team red, white, and blue shirt, of course. Um, you can see a little bit under here. You know, you are a longstanding member of team red, white, and blue. Yeah, I know you shared that before that, you know. I'm waiting when... for you to bring back the singlets that were the original version. <laughs> Actually, that yes. line is getting a little bit frayed at the edges. But yeah, well, I, I got a new one for you, sir. Yeah, absolutely. We, we've got one for you. Um, yeah, really great to know that, you know, that you represent and that you're a part of Team Red, White, and Blue. You know, again, the organization represents um, more than just this idea about the power of physical activity, but it's also a lot of what we talked about earlier, the importance of social connectivity, right? Like connecting with, you know, with fellow veterans. Um, but it's also this idea about a resilient mindset and, and competition, and, and it's all those things that you just described. Um, one more question for you. you know, um, let me uh, just okay, point out this as an yeah. aside. Um, a lot of the running that I've done in, in the past seven plus years uh, mm -hmm. since leaving government uh, has been in Central Park because that's where the, the offices for KKR is right up there right. and I've 
got an apartment nearby there for when I'm in New York City. And in fact, I think we've run there once. Yeah, several times. Um, and and often, if I'm wearing that TRWB shirt, and and of course it's got lettering on the yeah. back as well as on yeah. the front. As I'm going past people, of course, they're never going, actually, if they're going <laughs> past me as well, uh, often people do a double take and, and you know, they'll say, hey, red, white, and blue, hey, Joe Petraeus. We've <laughs> um, had little impromptu gatherings in there at various times. And um, one time in there, there was actually an ROTC unit in there, which I snuck up on, and uh, their cadence is a little ragged, so yeah. I, decided to offer they didn't know who i was initially until their officers yeah. came back and they heard this great cadence yeah. going on back there and <laughs> like who's that <laughs> so i mean it's wonderful to be back with the tribe as you well know and 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 that's why you know if you think about i mean look what do you miss when you take off the the military uniform for mm -hmm. the last time you miss these these elements that i talked about earlier it's a sense of mission larger than self a sense of identity mm -hmm. that comes from wearing a uniform. Um, and then there's a sense of community, those with, with whom you're privileged to, to perform these missions. And um, you can regain a bit of that uh, with a group like Team Red, White, and Blue, or a group like Team Rubicon, which serves veterans by serving others, uh, or a host of others. Uh, yeah. All of these American corporate partners, which you know helps mentor veterans uh, once they're in jobs or to even to, when they're considering jobs. Uh, just innumerable of these, uh, the Iraq Afghanistan Veterans of America, which is sort of the umbrella for all of this. Uh, Wounded Warrior Project, that obviously looks after those who paid the, the very considerable sacrifice. Uh, all, these are hugely important um, and they all continue that sense of, of identity, of community and a purpose uh, that you can lose, of course, when you are uh, no longer part of the, of the military. Yes, sir. Yeah, absolutely. And I remember, you know, you, do, you delivered, you know, a very similar message at the University of Michigan at the Student Veterans of America dinner to benefit Team Red, White, and Blue. I yep. believe it was back in January of 2013, maybe. I'm not sure. I lose track of the years. But, um, you know, there was a very similar message that you that delivered was. that that obviously resonates deeply, you know, with me and with so many people. Um, you know, what we've seen in, in the research that we've done at Team Red, White, and Blue is we kind of talk about um, three ways that you enrich a veteran's life, right? Health, people, and purpose. So, you know, uh, mental and physical health, the people that you just alluded to, and then purpose, that, that common cause, serving something bigger than yourself. And we've proven, right, through the research in partnership with Syracuse University, the Institute for Veterans and Military Families, that when you're active in Team Red, White, and Blue, we address all three of those things for you, um, which is why we're so fired up to continue sharing our mission. And we turned 10 years old this year. It's hard to believe that a decade's gone by like that, but you know, we're 217,000 today. Like the goal is to be a million members by the end of this decade in 2030. Um, and we know that the more veterans we can get to join our organization, the more effectively that we can impact their lives and enrich their lives you know, in, a, in a positive way, so. Um, absolutely. Uh, it, my, my, it's my, my final organization. Uh, I congratulate you again on the the idea that led to this. Yeah, well, I appreciate that. You know, so many people. You know, as you think about it, you know, as you obviously know, like you know, as the general, right? You know, there's all these people around you that you know that have helped to support you know the ideas and everything that you've done. And as I think about my role as the founder, you know, ten years ago, like there's just thousands, literally thousands of people who've given so much of their time and their energy to to bring the organization to where it is. And it's, as you know, sir, it's, it's very humbling, right? To see people so passionate, um, you know, about a cause that is so important. So yep, um, my, my final question for you, um, and this kind of, this kind of brings the conversation sort of full circle. Um, and if you were to have like, you know, your kind of your magic eight ball here, and, and I know that you don't, but uh, I'm probably going to say that about as well as anybody else out there, I would trust your assessment of this question. What do you think the world and specifically our country looks like, you know, um, let's just say six months from now, you know, it's an election year, right? So there's a lot going on there, but like, like how do we respond like as a country, as a world, you know, to the coronavirus? And, you know, do you see any permanent changes maybe that, that happen over time? But if you could look into that magic eight ball and say like six months or a year from now, like what's been the lasting impact of, of, of 
this uh, crisis? Well, obviously, we're still in the early stages uh, of it, at least in our own country. Others are in a bit later stage. Uh, China would be in that category. Uh, and other countries are not yet even in it. Uh, they're going mm -hmm. to be in it uh, as it's transmitted across their borders and throughout their society. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's quite premature to start, if you will, to hold forth on that, except that, of course, that's what, you know, folks like, me get paid to do and the, yeah. <laughs> you know, the Global Institute that I'm privileged to chair at KKR uh, uh, does for one of the world's biggest investment firms. Um, and having said that, having been a professor of economics at, at West Point mm -hmm. and then some other places, you know that you can never go wrong by answering a question like that if you say it depends. Yeah. Uh, because it does. It, mm -hmm. it depends a great deal on uh, how our economies uh, come back to life? Uh, what are mm -hmm. the long lasting economic effects? Uh, does this experience uh, change our travel and tourism and hospitality mm -hmm. uh, endeavors? Uh, do we reduce international uh, trade? Does this mm -hmm. cause people to question globalism? Um, what is the interaction between the leaders uh, of our countries? Do we come together in the face of this common challenge, which again is something in which we all should be united in, in ending uh, mm -hmm. this highly transmittable virus, uh, this contagion that has done so much damage, not just to the health of our, of our citizens, but to the very economy uh, of our country. Mm -hmm. So, you know, do we come together in that? Uh, do we share lessons? Do we share ultimately vaccines and, and other uh, treatments that are developed? Uh, do we readily share the medical equipment uh, that is needed if there's an excess in one country as it again is over the hump and other countries are just starting up the curve? Um, and again, there's just a host of different factors. I've actually been working to try at least to distill what those factors are uh, so that you can examine as we go along, uh, as we respond to the uh, coronavirus uh, pandemic and the economic uh, downdraft, and I mean this collapse that has resulted from the measures that have to be taken. Right. Uh, because if you don't have health, you can't have an economy. Uh, I think it was Lindsey Graham that pointed that out the other day. Um, I mean, there are people who are already holding forth. One of my old dissertation advisors uh, has uh, opined that, you know, we will be less open, less free, and less prosperous. I'm not sure I would go that far mm. yeah. uh, yet, but there are reasons, there are factors that are leading him to, to be inclined in that direction. And again, it's those factors, it's those elements uh, that we're watching now uh, to see whether or not when we come out of this, we're more united or perhaps um, less so, more divided, um, whether or not borders have been reinforced or if they've uh, been reduced. Uh, and again, mm -hmm. if patterns of uh, economic behavior, business travel, uh, tourism, cruise ship industries, all of this, Mm -hmm. um, and whether this comes back to the levels that it was before, surpasses them with pent up demand, um, or does not. And those are, again, the elements that we should all be watching to try to divine what the future holds uh, when this virus is defeated and when we've been able to bring our economies back to at least what they were before, if not better. Right. Yeah, that's... Uh... I appreciate that. Yeah, it's definitely, like you said, there are a lot of factors that are going to, you know, play into it. And I think that, yeah, there's just a lot of uncertainty uh, that you alluded to, but I think there's also this sense of optimism that a lot of, that a lot of us have that, um, you know, that things will return and that we will um, remain mostly united. I think we've seen a pretty good job of that so far, but definitely uh, it's like you said, it's so early into this. It's only been like, you know, seven or 10 days. Um, I mean, I was just up in New York city, like, you know, just less than two weeks ago and it just changed so drastically in that short of a period of time so um 
so I really appreciate you know you you spending some time with us today and uh, sharing everything from some uh, leadership examples and practices you know from throughout your life to your assessment of the current situation. I know members of Team Red, White, and Blue will be really excited to listen to this and to you know hear the insight from you. And we're just really grateful for you being a member of Team Red, White, and Blue. Uh, finding those impromptu opportunities to connect with people while you're out, you know, going for a run or, you know, out and about wearing your eagle and just are grateful for the time that you spent with us today. So thank you very much. Oh, thanks. Thanks, Mike. It's great to be back with a member of the old tribe. And um, for those who are wondering why I don't challenge you to a virtual push-up contest, I just <laughs> want it known that, that again, Freya the Wonder Dog is patiently yes. uh, sitting here waiting for me to take her for her next yes. walk. Uh, nice. during which I'll catch up with what's going on in the world through podcasts. Outstanding. And I, uh, I have no doubt that you would smoke me if we did. <laughs> so, <laughs> but uh, hey, thanks again, sir. Really appreciate you. And I right. uh, hope you have a uh, great rest of the day. You bet. Thanks, man. Thanks, sir.